Hey guys, hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you're listening to the show or evening or night. I appreciate you tuning in. I have a great show for you today where I welcome Sonia Jensen. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified Gottman Method couples and sex therapist. She's a leader in her field with extensive specialized training, but most importantly, Sonia brings genuine heart and warmth to her practice. And you will feel that today in my conversation with her, where we talk about toxic communication habits that couples have and how to unlearn them and replace them with good communication habits. We talk a lot about communication on the show. We can never really talk enough because it's so important to quality relationships. And I loved today's conversation with a lot of really actionable things that you guys can start doing, whether it's your romantic relationship, relationship with family, friends, coworkers, there's a lot of valuable things in here. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like the show, we love those five-star reviews on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening to us that helps us reach more people and continue to bring you these great conversations. I really love to be able to do it. I'm just right there along with you guys, getting the information, trying to apply it to my life. And I hope you guys find some value in these conversations. I think you do. There's lots of you out there who are always emailing us, leaving those reviews and uh, this is really the most important stuff we can do is to, to work on ourselves and work on our relationships to have a meaningful and purposeful and happy life. All right. Enjoy today's show. Today's episode is brought to you by our online course, Spark My Relationship. Do you guys want to create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days? Yes. Sign me up. (laughs) Then you guys need to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. It is an online course, like I mentioned, that we created with over 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you guys the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. We talk about it on the show, relationships take work. Sometimes they function pretty easily and you coast along, but we've found the reality is, is you have to do work sometimes and to make them better, to change them so that they're more satisfying for both partners. And you've made it here. You've made it to listening to our show. So you guys probably already know that a little bit, but what you might not know are the specific tools and exercises that you need to create those lasting and positive improvements in your relationship. And like Chase said, change does not happen on its own. It takes hard work. And that's why we created the course. Spark One Relationship is designed to infuse your life and relationship with fresh passion, skills, and wisdom. And it's a self-paced journey that's perfect for turning up the heat, having some fun together, and revolutionizing your intimacy and communication. And just some tools and strategies that the course includes is to how to eliminate unhelpful old habits, develop mindful awareness to help improve your stress management, learn healthy and successful communication tools, create a deeper and more intimate bond, and strengthen your couple microculture, which you will find out what that is. Uh, in the future together. So for our listeners only, we're offering a special of $100 off the course. Visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock to unlock your discount. And there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. So there really is no reason to not give it a try. So go to sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock for $100 off. Hi, Sonia. Thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Today, we're going to talk about toxic communication practices that couples should unlearn. And we're going to go over the practices and then talk about some things that we can replace them with, some healthy communication practices. 
So why don't you tell us some of the toxic things that we do when we communicate, and then we'll talk about how we can do it better. Absolutely. Well, right out the gate, the Gottman Institute is one of the uh, kind of leaders in our field of marriage and family therapy in terms of research and helping us understand what makes love last and ultimately what crushes love and kills communication. And John Gottman and his research became most popular for what he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And those are criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. Criticism means, you know, how we start out a conversation. Do we start it out with a blame, an accusation, or a you statement? Defensiveness is when I shut off really hearing what you're saying because I need to fight for my true intentions or what I really think. And then contempt comes when I I talk down to you, I call you names, or I say, I would never do that, or you always do that. And then stonewalling happens when a partner is present, but there there's no energy being given to the conversation. It's like talking to a brick wall. Uh, and those, when they are present in any form of communication, really lead to relationship instability. Let's talk about how we can do it better. And one of the, one of the things I really like as a, I don't know, not mantra, but, but just an easy thing to remember is to try to use I statements. And you mentioned that instead of you, because that a lot of times is immediately going to put our partner on the defensive and it's blaming. Absolutely. And I think to even take it a step further I statements are are helpful, but if I say like, I feel like you always, or I feel that, as opposed to, I really try to encourage couples to, when you're making an I statement, put an emotion after the word I. Like, I feel hurt, I feel dismissed, I feel angry, I feel abandoned, because that, when I, when I insert an emotion, uh, I, I give my partner an opportunity to meet me with empathy. Um, and then moving into what my experience has been about the situation and then be very clear about what I need in a positively stated way to make the situation go differently next time or to move it in the direction that it needs to go to get out of the rut that it's in. So we call that the softened startup. I feel about what I need. And so some clinicians, you will look at it this way. As an example, I can say, like, I feel really angry that I've asked repeatedly to have the trash taken out. And I just need you to do what you say you're going to do. Technically, that is a softened startup. But I think it's more helpful to say, I feel overwhelmed and like I'm overcompensating a lot for what's happening. And what's really important to me is that if there's a role that you're saying yes to, that is really something you can't do. Like, let's talk about what is doable um, because I really need to know how we can count on and depend on each other. I think that's a more positively stated way that even in and of itself reduces defensiveness because it's not accusatory. It's really talking about my own experience without ever talking about my partner. I love that example that you just gave, but it's not often easy to really dig into what it is that we're feeling. And what I heard you say there is instead of just saying I'm angry, it's like that hypothetical situation, that person dug into what is underlying the anger. And yes. and that's such a valuable skill. Can you talk a little bit about developing that muscle and, and how we can do that so that we can communicate with more depth. Absolutely. I think there it's very well known that in adult culture in America, we use about five emotions on the regular, uh, which is like happy, sad, tired, uh, pissed off or stressed out. Right. Um, and I, what I would say in my experience, I think those are what I call secondary emotions. They're, they're surface level emotions that don't give a whole lot of detail into what a person is actually experiencing and feeling. And if we don't start to dig a little bit deeper into what 
our primary emotions are, we're not really having any kind of depth with ourselves and with our partner. And it's extremely challenging, especially if we grow up in environments where emotions were not readily talked about. So what I have done in my own practice with clients and myself is um, you can go on Google and just type in emotional vocabulary. And um, I always give a copy of this to my clients, but again, you can download it and there's tons of different graphs out there. But I use it as a journaling experience. If I want you as a couple to practice that soften startup, I feel about what I need. I also want you to do that practice with yourself at the end of the day. And you can do this through writing or just pondering and um, meditating on it. But do a self-check-in or reflection of what your emotions are at any point in the day, utilizing the emotional vocabulary sheet that you have so you have more words available to you. Think about why that emotion is coming up for you. And say, for example, you know, you identify this feeling of being lonely or burned out. I would ask myself, what's the opposite of lonely? Well, the opposite of lonely would be close or connected. Or what's the opposite of feeling burned out? It would be rested or refreshed or supported. And then I ask myself, well, how would I feel refreshed, supported, uh, or connected to either myself or the other person. And I think that changes and helps us develop that positively stated need um, as to focus on just like, I don't want to feel this negative emotion, but what positive emotion do I, I want to feel and how might I experience that? And I think if it's practiced on a day-to-day basis with yourself, because you can't communicate what you don't know. And so a lot of couples work is really individual work that happens on the side as well so that you can more accurately, can, you know, present your needs and your feelings to your partner. I love that practice of thinking about what the opposite is. That's so valuable in, in a way to frame it, to figure out what our need is. Let me ask you, I, I read nonviolent communication a little over a year ago, and I loved it. But I found that in the relationship that I was in, I was maybe over communicating if that makes mm. sense. And and so related to this, maybe you could talk about or help me out and I'm, hopefully our listeners as well of when do we need to communicate something to our partner, like how we feel and what we need. And when should we kind of work through that stuff ourselves? Because I think it's not always about like, oh, I'm feeling anxious and I need to tell my partner. It's like sometimes I need to deal with that on my own because that can way down the relationship. And uh, I found that through personal experience. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a very nuanced answer and dependent a lot on the situation and depending on how, um, you know, deep in conflict and issues the couples are can make all the difference in the answer to this question. But to, to give you an overview, I think we have to really critically evaluate the type of role we want our partner to play in our lives because they can't be everything to us. There are certain things that we need um, a therapist for or certain things we need a personal trainer for or certain things we need a friend for um, that I think a lot of us are taught in romantic movies too, that like our partner's going to be our everything. Um, but we, I also love the quote, like the relationship that you have with yourself sets the tone for every other relationship in your life. And it is really important for me if I'm doing that practice of like, I'm lonely, but I would like to feel connected. And how would I feel connected? I would even take that a step forward. And what can I do to connect better with myself at this moment? What can I do to provide myself some sort of relaxation that I need since I am burned out before I start to think, what can my partner do about it for me? Or what can somebody else do about it for me? Because I do feel like I am responsible for understanding myself and taking care of myself um, because we need boundaries. And boundaries is, you know, really how you teach others to love you. And if you don't know how to love you, you might require all of that love coming from another person. And that imbalances the scales and puts a lot of heavy expectations on your partner that they can't meet. So to boil it down, you know, if you're going to use that practice, I would start by asking yourself, how can I give this to myself first? What is my responsibility in the role to give myself or to foster this positive emotion that I'm looking for? 
That's why I brought that up. And, and you're exactly right. Like there's a lot of nuance and every situation's different. But I think that's an important perspective to have of like, rather than we're getting these great communication tools. And if you're not communicating at all, like we need to have that. But then it's not all about like, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to be in touch with my feelings and I got to share it with my partner. But looking at ourselves first of like, okay, I'm feeling lonely. I don't necessarily need to just take that to my partner because maybe that has most things to do with me. I mean, it always starts with us, right? It it does. Absolutely. I think there's also a component too of, you know, how we were brought up and our attachment styles too, to our primary caregivers or in other romantic relationships that we have, because how we show up in a relationship is, um, it is largely dependent on what we understand or need a relationship to be. And if we are very anxious about keeping a partner um, and, and, and being too much for them, we will often withhold our needs and become, you know, um, very insecure about having any, become hyper-independent. And that doesn't, isn't supportive of a conducive, a healthy, productive relationship either. Um, so I, I do think it's important like to know that needs in a relationship are, are how you build trust. Um, but you do have to think about what did you learn about having needs when you were growing up or what have you, what stories do you tell yourself about having needs in this relationship or having feelings, um, in your, with your primary caregivers or having feelings with a partner. Um, I think it's really critically important to understand the stories we tell ourselves about our feelings and our needs as it, as it relates to the intimate relationships in our lives, because that can tell us a lot about how we're going to show up with them, whether or not we have them, whether or not they, we expect too much from our partner, or if we need to um, kind of filter this through, what can I do for myself? I know every situation is different and I don't want to get us too sidetracked on this, but it's such a foundational thing of, how we were taught to to be in relationship or what it is our needs are and what we're modeled in attachment styles. And I highly encourage people to listen to some of our episodes on attachment styles. But what do you tell people as far as what, how to think about what they should expect from a relationship? That's a, that's a great question. I feel like it's important to uh, expect in a relationship that you can share a need and that it is okay to, to recognize if my partner is sharing a need that I might not always be able to fill that need, but I can at least acknowledge it, right? I think needs should be acknowledged in every relationship. I think it's really important that to expect that you have a partner who is consistent in the way that they show up and honest in what they can and can't be in a relationship. Because what I often hear is people over, like they'll over promise and under deliver. Uh, and so I think it's really important to expect honesty, transparency. And also, um, I think it's very important to expect that uh, we are seen and valued by our partner, not always agreed with, but that our opinions matter, our insight matters. And both people, uh, we can grow and learn from each other's different experiences without our different opinions are experiencing being threatened, uh, threatened by the other persons. Thank you for that. That's so valuable. And uh, yeah, it's such a big part of being in relationship is what we expect from it. And, and I think oftentimes we have unrealistic expectations and there's just so much wrapped up in there. And, and as you alluded to, like understanding how those expectations are, are formed from childhood, from the relationships that are modeled for us. So we we can dive into that in another episode we have in the past. I want to continue to talk about communication. We talked about using I statements, identifying our, our emotions, and, and then sharing our needs. What are some other bad habits that we have in communication? Yeah, defensiveness. You moving into the second of the four horsemen. Defensiveness is really, I think, comes up naturally when there's a culture in the relationship of feeling on guard or misunderstood. And so instead of being able to hear my partner's feelings and their needs, I feel threatened by their feelings and their needs. And, and so one of the things that we teach couples to do is 
when you start to feel defensive, one, you need to recognize it. What often happens is we act out of defensiveness instead of stating, I'm feeling defensive. Can you try stating that in a softer way? Or um, can you try framing it this way or helping me better understand what your intention or your meaning was behind sharing this with me? So asking a question, staying curious, and then also accept responsibility. Um, I am a, 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 a human being who makes mistakes. And while I have all the best intentions in the world, um, I hurt your feelings um, or the the mark got missed to your expectations. And so I can acknowledge responsibility by validating my partner's feelings. And validation doesn't mean that I agree with you, but I can see that how you interpreted what happened to be hurtful to you. And you can also accept responsibility through maintaining eye contact and nodding your head and leaving there to be more space for your partner to share what's going on. I think what it really, what I see couples really struggle with when it comes to defensiveness is that um, I, it, we always focus more on our intentions than our partner's experience of their own feelings and their own narrative. And how can we ever learn our partner if we constantly tell them that the way they perceived it was incorrect? We're missing an opportunity to grow and accept influence. And what accepting influence means is like there are two different realities here and both of them are valid. Uh, my partner is a unique human being with unique experiences, and I want to be able to draw a map from A to Z. If you're telling me that Z is you felt really unheard and you're angry and you have this need, what was A? How did we start there? Like, I want to ask you questions to figure out how your brain works so I can better interact with in an intimate way the way that your brain works. Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. Spring fever is in the air. With the smell of fresh blooms and the sun shining down on us, you can't help but feel inspired to spice things up and explore your inner desires and fantasies. Find stories that match your mood this season on Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. Seriously, they have stories for every Everyone and every fantasy. Find stories about that intriguing coworker with a British accent or hooking up with your hot yoga teacher. If you thought about it, they probably have it. New content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and now they also offer written stories. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with a partner. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash I do. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsy, D-I-P-S-E-A, stories.com slash I do. Dipsystories.com slash I do. Quitting smoking is hard, and you don't have to be a smoker to know that. I've personally never been a regular smoker, but several people close to me have been, and I've witnessed their experiences trying to quit. It's super frustrating, exhausting, and not fun. When someone you're close to is struggling, whether it's a romantic partner, a family member, or a good friend, you naturally become invested in what's best for them. That's why you've got to check out Fume. Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit smoking cigarettes. It's a no smoke, no vape, no nicotine replacement for the hand to mouth habit of smoking. Fume combines the benefit of natural plants and behavioral science to distract smokers from their craving in a natural way. One of the reasons I think Fume is effective is because it's emphasis on replacing the habit. Fume handcrafts wooden inhalers and uses natural flavors to curb cravings. They have flavors like peppermint to conquer with the minty notes to stimulate menthol cigarettes and other flavors like cozy chai for a sweeter experience. And all of their flavors are 100% natural, no harmful chemicals, no artificial flavors, and absolutely no nicotine. 
Quitting is tough, but Fume can really help. If you have doubts, they've got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who have tried everything else and this worked. Whether you're a smoker or an ex-smoker who struggles with cravings, Fume is perfect for you. Head to breathefume.com slash I do and use the promo code I do to save 10% off your entire order. That's breathe. Fume, B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M dot com slash I do to save 10% off your entire order. I wanted to emphasize the asking questions. I love that as another tool that that's easy to remember, like saying I statements instead of you is to to instead of responding defensively to think about. A, a question to ask your partner around what's happening. If they come at you with some aggressive communication or even if it's... It's hard to hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can say like, oh, I, I see that you're upset. W- what's going on? It's so valuable. Yeah. I think the way you're modeling that is perfect, right? But what often happens when I start teaching couples how to ask questions their tone is not curious. Their tone is accusatory or leading. Um, And so you want to make sure that your tone is soft and truly your tone is curious. And then also your question is open-ended, meaning I don't have, I, I don't have an idea exactly of how you're going to answer this. It's not going to be answered with a yes or no. I'm truly interested to hear what your perspective is outside of what I think your perspective is or what I think my perspective is about the situation. So I really want to ask, tell me more about that or help me understand how you got to that or what does feeling happy and connected in our relationship really look like for you since I'm hearing you don't feel that way. Um, So really wanting to ask thoughtful questions in a curious tone that elicit stories instead of yes or no answers. Oh, you brought up tone. That's a whole other area of communication that's so important. I'm glad you did because it's like, yeah, you can ask a question, but how are you asking it? Like, yeah, what's the pitch of your voice? What are you body language? It, you know, I almost think of body language. I know it's not tone, but they're in the same neighborhood of it's not explicitly what we're saying, but it's how we're saying it. It's so key. Yes. And, and I think it's okay to acknowledge to your partner that I'm really having a hard time hearing what you're saying. I know you're sharing your feelings, your needs, but I'm, I'm feeling myself getting really defensive here. And I, I know that's not productive. Maybe you need a break. Maybe you need to say that, have them say it in a different way. Maybe you need a moment to collect yourself to like, um, to, to get out of that triggered state. So I, I think it's really helpful. Like if we just act off defensiveness or we shut down, our partner is going to develop a negative narrative about sharing their feelings or needs with us. And that usually, you know, spins off an argument. Um, so if we don't clarify what's really happening or what we need in that moment, um, you know, we're not really helping the, the relationship move forward. Let's talk about stonewalling, what it is and how to navigate it. Stonewalling is, I think, a result of feeling powerless or feeling hopeless. We get to the point in our communication dynamic uh, where it's like, is it even worth sharing my feelings? Is it even worth having a feeling or a need because you don't I've seen it be unproductive in the past. So like, I don't want to give energy to it anymore. Or I feel just really defeated and um, like I've lost hope. But there's also a physiological component to stonewalling. Um, In the Gottman method, the anecdote for stonewalling is emotion regulation. Uh, It's taking a pause point. Um, So what does emotion regulation look like? Um, Why do we need emotion regulation? We need emotion regulation because our bodies are triggered. and to understand what triggering really is, um, you kind of have to understand trauma brain modeling. And so to, to get real Cliff Notes version with you, um, in trauma counseling, we talk about the triune brain. And in, in the back of the brain, at the brain stem, we call that the reptilian part of the brain, where that's where we process basic needs. And then we move into the middle part of the brain, and we call that the mammalian part of the brain, which is where we process emotions to basic needs. 
And then in the front of our brain is what we call the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is responsible for putting words to our feelings and our needs um, and being able to articulate that and communicate that to another person. And, and you have to feel safe in order to do that. Um, and then we have this tiny little part of our brain called the amygdala. And from the day that we are born until today, it has constantly scanned the environment for anything that has ever felt unsafe, a word, a tone, um, an experience, a date. I mean, it can be uh, the weather. And when our amygdala has something that it doesn't like, what it does is it shuts off the prefrontal cortex. And when the prefrontal cortex is shut, shut off, you're only working off of basic need and, and, and basic emotions. Um, and so you're just in a reactionary state. Your body is surging with stress hormones that are cortisol and adrenaline. And in that moment, your brain is incapable of practicing empathy and retaining new information. And this is when couples fight. So stonewalling is really, not all people stonewall. Some people get really upset and aggressive and move to contempt to really be heard. And they're still having the same physiological response as the person who is stonewalling. They're just presenting it in a different way. But basically what it is, is I'm, I'm having a reactionary emotion out of feeling unsafe in the relationship or unsafe in the situation. And so my body is either shutting down or it's gearing up for a fight. It's that fight, flight, freeze or fawn mode. And, um, what couples have to understand is that when you're hit, when you're hitting stonewalling, you have to take an, a, a minimum of 20 minutes of active distraction and relaxation before your stress hormones can start to normalize themselves out. So you have the ability to practice empathy and take in new information. Um, and you have to know how to emotionally regulate and self-soothe. Um, and so that's why there's a lot of individual work that goes into couples work. Thank you for breaking down the physiology of it. And yeah, it's almost, I don't want to say we can feel powerless, but in a sense, we are not in great control. Like when those things are happening and like you said, it's like almost impossible to have empathy when you're in that reactionary state in our, in our heads. And that's why we want to calm down. Like you said, take the pause. Meditation's great. But to have that mindfulness so that we're aware of what's happening, not so much to prevent it from even coming up, but being like, oh, OK, I feel that coming. Uh, but that, that's that's the recognition is hard. And then the ability to say, hey, uh, I need let's take 20 minutes and, and talk about this when we're more calm. Well, I think you make a really great point there. What often happens is we stonewall and then we just leave. Um, and the the fear is for the other partners that we're never going to come back and talk about it. So if you are recognizing that you're in a physiologically aroused state and you can't hear and you can't practice empathy, um, it's important to state when you're going to come back and talk about it. Like, I'm going to go calm down. Even having a safe word, right? I'll have a lot of couples that will develop a safe word that communicates all of that in one word. Like, it means we're both going to separate from each other for 30 minutes and then we're going to come back and talk about it or at least check in with each other if I'm in the right place or if we need to um, consider when we're going to be with a better bandwidth to 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 talk about the the issue that we need to talk about. Um, so I, I think that's really important. But I also would go back into we can automatically get triggered even if our partner is using the soft and startup because there could be emotions that our partner has that are automatically triggering to us, no matter how kind they are or deep they are. Like I could be deeply triggered by the feeling of disappointment or of disappointing my partner. I could be deeply triggered um, by being misunderstood. And so even though it's maybe being communicated in a, in a healthy and productive way, the emotion itself is triggering to me based off of past experience. So one of the last emotions we're going to talk about is contempt. And you, you mentioned it. That's basically in the same neighborhood as stonewalling, but just the, the acting out version, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, to best describe contempt, I, I start with 
you know, I, I call um, criticism the gateway drug to the rest of the four horsemen, because if I come at you and I'm like, you didn't this or you always this, and then my partner responds with defensiveness because I initially felt unheard or misunderstood or like that my partner didn't care about what I was saying. Then I get louder and more aggressive to get my point across, even being very cutting and very black and white and demeaning to my partner because I... I feel on her, but yes, there's a physiological arousal component to contempt that I think is there, but people who utilize contempt a lot, um, they might not seem physiologically aroused. They're just always kind of self-protective. Any of these four horsemen, when they're utilized are signs of disrespect and lack of trust. Couples who, who have really good communication and, um, a strong friendship, um, I, they repair better and have more grace. They read less negativity into their partner's experiences. Whereas if people use contempt a lot, uh, we're basically like, why are we holding weapons instead of using tools? Um, so contempt is really the most deadly in a sense of all of the four because um People who hear contempt a lot have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and uh, an inability to heal from illness, unlike people who don't experience or hear contempt. I'm glad you mentioned just the the general idea that if there's a foundation of respect and trust, a lot of times, I mean, it, it's kind of obvious, but it needs to be said that, that that's going to make communication easier and better, that if we assume our partner is coming from a good place, even when they they sound like they're not, they're not communicating, maybe because they're triggered, they're not communicating from the, a great place. If we can be respectful, trust that, that they're doing their best, that they also want to respect us, then that sets the foundation for everything. We still need to to communicate better, the I statements and understanding our emotions, communicating our needs. But that foundation that you mentioned is, is really key. Foundation is so important. And I think you have to look at it from the perspective of, is there more good things happening in this relationship that overwhelm the negative? Or is it the opposite? Are we kind of just moving through life like two ships passing in the wind, avoiding conflict or being super aggressive or passive aggressive um, way that we live life together? And if we if there are more negative um, things happening in the relationship or the absence of positive things happening in the relationship, couples get into what we call negative sentiment override and negative sentiment override if we are in it we are more likely to take everything, even positive or indifferent things our partner says and skew them with a negative lens and react automatically. So we're talking about the four horsemen, but in order to really utilize them effectively and not get so triggered in communication, it really does mean putting a lot of work and uh, into how we maneuver through our day-to-day -day life together that showcases that we love each other, we respect each other, needs are important, um, we see the good things that are happening, and we're, we're taking time out each day to prioritize the relationship in some sort of meaningful way. All of that has a huge impact on whether or not we feel we have to use weapons in conflict, and weapons meaning any of the four horsemen. Well, thank you so much, Sonia. This has been very concise and informative. And I know our listeners are going to love it. Before we wrap up, are there any things that we skipped over or maybe something you want to emphasize? And then we'll say goodbye. Absolutely. Well, one, thank you for the opportunity. And the, the last thing I would leave all the listeners with is that communication is there's every relationship is different and the issues within each relationship um, were built there for a reason. And if we if we are always protecting ourselves from our partner, meaning withholding our needs or utilizing weapons in conflict, it doesn't necessarily mean that our partner is a bad partner, but they might not know why we're responding the way we are. And then I think we focus more on each other's behaviors or lack of response than on like really developing the skills that it takes to see each other in a new light and developing positive stories about each other. Um, and so looking for even in small ways, highlighting and then verbalizing the things that your partner is doing 
that are that you see are beneficial to the relationship on a day-to-day basis because that in and of itself reduces conflict dramatically um, because when I really feel like my partner doesn't care, my brain highlights that information more readily than it does the things that my partner does do every day to showcase um, that they do care. And I I think it's really important that whatever you look for, you'll find, and that's going to have a direct impact on how you communicate. I love it, Sonia. That is so valuable and a great place to leave this conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Before we say goodbye, can you tell our listeners where they can find you online? Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. You can uh, find me at soniajensen.com. I have a weekly newsletter that goes out. And then also you can find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok at at the Sonia Jensen. Uh, So I'd love to connect and keep in touch with all of you. Excellent. Well, we'll have those links in the show notes and on our website at idopodcast.com. And thanks again for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. As always, all the links to the guest as well as any of their recommendations will be in the show notes page. You can find the link to that in the episode description or by going to idopodcast.com. Click on the podcast tab up at the top and you will have access to all the episodes that we've ever done. There are over 300 of them. Uh, And while you're on our website, if you haven't checked out our free 14 day happy couple challenge, we really hope you do. It's a free email challenge that we send to you. It's 14 days of fun, easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And if you're looking for something that provides a little more help with working on your relationship, whether it's improving intimacy or communication with your partner or just bringing the spark back, we would love for you guys to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. We're offering $100 off to all of our listeners if you go to sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. We've worked with over 15 psychologists and therapists to create the real life tools and strategies that they are teaching their clients. So we wanted to give them to you. It's a self-paced online course that can be done in as little as a month or up to three months. You can really decide how much or how little you want to do with your partner or maybe just yourself. So we hope you guys check that out. It's sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. Have a great day.